Okay, welcome back. We continue with the last four speakers, if I'm correct. Uh, we continue first with Vincent. Vincent uh, Masoyer uh, has worked with, with Blueprint Automation on computer vision platform for the localization and grading of deformable packaging. You'll tell them everything that's, uh, that explains that. I'll tell you what your colleagues were thinking about you. Vincent is a creative, resourceful process master. Creative with good ideas, critical, sometimes very critical. And he asks really good questions to the point and helps solve problems. He's quality driven and looks for the optimal solution to problems. Vincent has a very broad interest, which enables him to be very creative in solving very difficult problems. And he always gave us critical and constructive feedback. Or is yours? Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, dear colleagues. Um, and thank you all for being here this afternoon, today. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Vincent Mazoyer. The project um, I'll talk about is the vision platform for the localization and grading of deformable packaging. This was held at the company Blueprint Automation in Worden. My uh, supervisor from the university side is uh, Frank Sperling for the company from Schmiermann and uh, colleague mentor was Thijs Wenswein. Thijs also worked 50% uh, of his time on this project. And also would like to thank them because they are all here today um, for this presentation. So also thank for this. So let's start the presentation. First, Blueprint Automation, the company, and what they do. What they do um, are secondary packaging machines. And secondary packaging is, um, well, for example, if you have a bag of chips, this is a naked product. And then you have a first package, which is the one that you as consumer get when you are at the um, uh, shop. Secondary packaging is taking this um, first one into a box and is also so-called tertiary packaging, which is then to make everything ready for shipment. Blueprint Automation, the company, they make the machines, that Delta robots, for example, that pick the bags and put them into boxes. So here you have an example of uh, a machine with four robots inside and um, yeah, the vision part that we will now be talking about. A specificity in this project are deformable packages. So we make three main categories. The first one are printed packages, um, also plain, so homogeneous color and transparent ones. And this is something quite specific because in many vision applications, at least in the industry, you always have rigid surfaces. So you know what the geometry is and it remains constant or almost constant. Deformal are by definition very different in this aspect. In my project, I focused on printed bags. So now let's go a bit deeper into what the vision system is and does. So in such a machine, until now, it was this vision box here at the entrance. So you had products coming in, going through the vision system, and then being picked and placed by the robots. Essential roles, well, the first one is to localize the product, see where it is on the conveyor belt, and then tell the robot, OK, here it is, and you can get to, uh, to pick it. And there are a second role, which is to grade the product and check, for example, if the seal is correctly made, um, if a sticker is correctly applied, um, and order checks. But those are the main ones. And currently, the company is using third-party sensors from other uh, suppliers, namely a smart camera and a laser-based system. But they were not really satisfied with those uh, systems, and then they wanted a new solution, better fitting. That's how this project came to life. So why a new vision system? Let's talk a bit about the limitations that the company uh, was facing. Uh, mainly, they didn't find any specific solution for the formal packages. That's really their core business. And yeah, there was no matching solution on the market. Also, they were facing low flexibility and they weren't really able to customize. They always had to go, they were dependent from the suppliers asking for a very specific solution that wasn't practical. 
Also, the vision systems until now are working only for separated products. So if the products are touching each other, then the, the localization doesn't work anymore. And that's especially critical if you're dealing with bulk products, because then you need a special machine that is called a feeder, that the sole purpose is to separate the products so that they are not touching anymore, and also not overlapping, of course. So this makes the whole solution really costly, and increase the overall footprint of the machinery on the, um, on the shop floor. So just to give you a visual impression, um, this is based on, on one uh, project you will see afterwards. Uh, if this is the imaginary shop floor surface, actually 70% is dedicated to the separation of products, and only 30% uh, are remaining for the actual packaging operation. So here you're start seeing um, the benefit if we can actually get rid of this or at least massively reduce this percentage. I've uh, shown you a few things. Now, to give you a better impression, I want to show a, a presentation video about one solution. So this is a, a robotic assembly line. In the background, a bit hidden, here you have three Delta robots doing pick and place operations. And here you see those feeder units taking products from bulk. You see them here all bulk products, and um, using various mechanical tricks to separate them from each other. You see, for example, so lifting the products. And also, one thing is, um, you see some products actually do the circle several times. So that also means every time you have a bit of damage to the product, which is something you want to avoid. And since we have here three robots, we have three of those separating machines. Um, also look at the quantity of sensors that you have here. Every blinking light here is a uh, small uh, vision sensor, and for every sensor you have at least one um, servo motor, so you can start calculating a bit the cost of this solution. And again, it's a beautiful machine, but the only aim is that you have packages entering the vision system one by one. And this is the last step, just um, making sure the packages are flat enough to be recognized. Okay, just want to show you the, the final step. So here, the products enter the vision system, we see it very shortly, but it's in this box, and here you have the robo Delta robot actually doing the pick and place, and that's the real added value of this machine, uh, together with the putting into the carton box. So he, um, yeah, here you see again the vision box. Okay, so we've seen limitations, you have an impression of how the system looks like, now let's talk also about the new needs that the company uh, has. And they want something um, in-house under their control that they can customize to fit the requirements of their clients and also avoid dependency towards suppliers. So for this, uh, an important requirement was to have a modular and extendable platform. And I stress this out also because the company has a very, um, has the mean machine types, but also very specific requests from clients. So they often have to change to adapt the solutions depending on what the actual requests are. Also, they wanted uh, to use open source software and commonly available hardware, again, avoiding dependency. They wanted to avoid this complex mechanical preparation, uh, namely the feeder machines. And that meant uh, for them uh, reaching what they call shallow pile picking. And what does shallow pile picking mean? Well, here I give you uh, examples of complexities. This one are just single packages, uh, not touching each other. So that's what the current systems uh, can do. And already touching packages is a challenge uh, in many cases. You see uh, shallow pile picking is here. So a definition is that you don't have more than two products on top of each other. You're not uh, building a heap, and every product is kind of still touching the supporting surface or conveyor belt. And uh, the ultimate goal of the company is to perform what they call bin picking, which are just really products in a heap. And the main difference is in the top view is quite similar, but here you, you really need the head information to know where you have to pick the, pa the package. Here you know, well, the difference will not be so big. So in this project, we focused on shallow pile picking. To give you an impression, this is how a shallow pile can look like uh, from the top. So that's what the camera sees. And the simple task is, well, pick the topmost. Um, you don't want to pick, for example, this package here 
because then um, the gripper of the robot will probably grasp also this package, and then you don't know what's going to happen. Probably the pick will fail. Maybe the product will just fly around in the machine, and you want to avoid this. To reach shallow pile picking, we had to make a tiny difference in the architecture. So until now, the vision system, as I've shown you in this picture, was at the entrance of the machine. So that means, basically, the machine was seeing the product only once, and then trusting that there is no change in the position. Um, in the new architecture, we have the sensor in the robot's working area where the products are picked. And so that's a bit how it looks like inside the machine. That means we are updating during the operation, and also we can recover from changes. Because if you have products touching each other and you pick one, it's highly likely that you will disturb a bit the configuration. Then you can, uh, in this new system, new architecture, again, take the information and know where the updated locations are. Also, we develop a software architecture. And um, this is the case packer, so all the robots and, and um, box um, upbringing system. And you have, we developed a machine interface block, um, also with the sensors. And basically, as soon as the robot is outside of the field of view, it sends a trigger message saying, OK, now you can take a frame and, um, and start processing, detect the products, and grade them. And once this is done, we can format the data back and send it to the actual robot saying, OK, you can pick there. Again, important requirements were that this platform is both modular and extendable. So we designed it in a way that we can exchange the blocks and, for example, target different machines built by the company. Or we can say, OK, our configuration of sensor is a bit different. Now we have this amount of sensor or that type of sensor also exchangeable change the image processing algorithms, and also the way we format the data. So basically, we built a generic framework for vision applications so the company can develop its own solutions from now on. A word about component selection. Uh, in terms of software, they wanted to uh, look at what is doable with open source software, and also avoid license costs, especially because then License costs are things usually you pay ev on every system, so it can become really costly in the overall, um, overall solution. And for this, we selected uh, a Linux operating system called Ubuntu. We developed using the Python language, and we used OpenCV, open source and free library for computer, uh, computer vision applications. For the hardware, we wanted to have easily second sourceable components and avoid dependency. And also, that was quite specific demand. They wanted to see what is actually possible to achieve with consumer electronic devices for an industrial application. So we used a laptop, consumer laptop, and a few webcams. So again, this is the top view of a shallow pile. How do we actually find a pickable product? Well, to do this, we have to go through three main steps. And the first one is to detect products, then calculate the overlaps, and finally find the topmost one. I'll now guide you shortly through those main steps. So first, detecting a product. This is the top view again, what the camera sees. And we use a reference image, a template of what product looks like. Um, we use also a technology called Keypoint, which is quite well known in the computer vision uh, domain, and uh, a matcher. And basically, Keypoint say, OK, it is an interesting point on this package or in this picture. And by matching from the template to what we see um, in the robots area, we can have the homography. And this actually means we know the position of the product in the scene, so on the conveyor belt, just getting the, the, the position. Now we know the positions. We can calculate the overlaps. This is quite simple geometry, but just finding, OK, between the red and the blue package, we have this overlapping area. And the last step is to find the topmost. And this is a very important and critical step, not to be mistaken here. So if I take another example of a top view with two packages overlapping, this is the area of interest, because here we have, based on this information, purely visual information, we have to decide which package to pick. We developed two 
completely independent tests. And while they are not equally good in all circumstances, sometimes the one is more accurate than the other, but we also uh, found it interesting, well, if we have two independent sources of information, and sometimes the one is, uh, is accurate, sometimes the other, most of the time both, but then we can merge the results and increase the overall accuracy of, of the results. So we merged the results, and we're able to predict or um, yeah, decide which one is on top and which one should be picked. If I go back to the view I've shown uh, to you before, if you look at the overlaps here, well, you see that uh, this product is covered by that one, which is covered by that one, and so on until this one here. And the other way around, you also have those products here being covered and this one the topmost. So actually here we have two clearly pickable products, which is this one and that one. And er if everything goes well in the system, the result you have is this, which are like bounding boxes of detected products, overlapping areas, and indeed the two peak points I mentioned. And here actually you see a third peak point. The reason for this is because I haven't told you the whole story, but <laughs> You can have situations where actually every product is slightly overlapping each other, and then you have some kind of loop, and you can never do anything out of it. So we relaxed a bit the constraints, and we told the system, hey, look, actually here, it's quite tiny, so we can still pick this product, so it's still okay. This offers some more flexibility. I wanted to show you a bit how it looks in, uh, in reality. So this is the peak belt. You have the products incoming. And the camera is uh, yeah, looking uh, straight down. The robot's head is here for now. This is the place belt. And yeah, it starts recognizing the products and picking the one always on the top. I didn't add any uh, nice music, but it will be a good addition for next time. To think about it. So. We focused on the bare functionality. As you can see, the attack time of the pick and place operation for now is much slower than what you see in the actual production application. So this is not ready yet for uh, usage in an industrial application because of the, of the speed. Um, but the bare functionality is there. And you will see now there's a slight surprise. Yeah, it missed the pick because we were actually playing around with the settings of the robot, so this never happens in an actual case. But I still want to show this to you because it demonstrates that because we have the sensors in the robot's area, we are now able to recover from such um, um, yeah, happenings. So we failed one pick, but the product was still recognized and we could pick it the next time. So again, we will actually fix this from the core and avoid such a, a situation, but it just demonstrates the capacity. The results of these projects, well, two parts. The first one is this extendable and modular computer vision platform. And um, this is really a framework for new vision applications that the company can now use and develop its own solutions without depending. Yeah, that's a very important thing. They are now independent from dire suppliers. And the second main result is the shallow pilot taking functionality. Again, a year ago, this was just not possible. This was kind of a dream within the company, and we made it happen. This uh, greatly simplifies the mechanical feeding mechanism, and also it reduces the overall uh, footprint of the solution. Plus, the extra benefit is this functionality is built on top of the framework, so it also validates that the framework actually works as we, we say that it would. The contribution we made to the company is that Blueprint Automation can now uh, develop its own vision applications, uh, reduce its dependency towards the suppliers, pick touching and overlapping uh, products, simplify the way the products are fed to the machine, and again, reduce the overall footprint of uh, the packaging mine. So that was my presentation. I hope you enjoy it, and now please Come with your questions. Thank you.
thank you for the presentation. Uh, so I had a question regarding the approach in which you do the picking process. Mm -hmm. So first you identify the product, then you find the overlap, and then you pick up the most or the topmost product. Why can't you do it the other way? So find out the topmost product and then check for overlap. So basically by doing inverted approach, you basically reduce on the initial time. So the robot starts picking up the topmost one. So by just uh, depth perception, you can pick up the product. And at the later stage, then you can see for right overlap product and then again do the topmost check and then you can pick it up. So instead of identifying the products itself. So one of the computational part can be excluded. Mm. Would that be an option? <laughs> OK, I'm not sure to fully understand your, your question. But if you say first you pick the topmost, yep. but then you already have to know what it, which one is the topmost. So from my, um, so I'm just brainstorming here. So uh, by looking at uh, the image, you can also, uh, from your camera, you can also do depth perception in order to find out which objects. So basically, you will have a. Uh, baseline, and then you'll have products on top of it. So you'll have different depth estimates from your uh, image that you see. And you can identify the most top one. And then you can basically use the robot to pick that one up. Mm -hmm. Could that be an option instead of going through this? In that case, you first need to just specify how your product looks like. And then by doing, uh, instead of a overlap, by doing the topmost identification stuff, you can pick it already. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if I understand correctly, you made this hypothesis that you have the depth information available, yeah. Yeah. which we do not have here, because we have a monocular vision application. Okay. And even though we organize the products, actually, well, we have the homographies, so we know uh, about like the distance, but mm -hmm. this measurement is not precise enough to say, because I mean, here we have only two layers, so the difference in height or depth is a few millimeters, maybe a centimeter at most. So the accuracy of our distance estimation is not good enough to say this. Indeed, if we switch to, for example, uh, stereoscopic vision or another mean of measuring distance, like time of flight sensors or, or so, yeah. then your approach can be indeed uh, used, yes. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. I couldn't notice this image. The first one is the yellow one, the second one is the blue one, and how come a third one is, you know, that one, and it's not, you know, a one, you know, beside the blue one? I, because I a one, you know, beside the a blue one, once a blue one is, you know, picked up, mm -hmm. it doesn't have any, any interaction with anything. So how come the other one, which has, you know, interaction with to other, you know, product is in a you know, third place. Um, so you mean why not? Uh, so the blue one, you mean, for example, this one? Or? No, 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 no. A one beside the blue one. So a first one is a yellow one. A second one is the blue one. Mm -hmm. And you said that a third one is the a pink one, yeah? Yes. How come a third one is a pink one? Why a one beside mm -hmm. the blue one can be easily a third one? And it's a much better option because it doesn't have any interaction with the others. Mm -hmm. Well, um, actually, for now, we haven't uh, optimized the sequence. Because indeed, for example, actually, we're throwing a lot uh, of data away that we could reuse. And this is, these are further steps of development of this system. Because, um, for example, one strategy is to say, well, um, now we're just taking one product, taking a new frame, processing everything, and, and so on and so forth. But we could say the, the distance between those two products is so high that we know that by picking this one, we will not disturb that one. So we can actually pick those two and then get to the new frame. That's one thing. But the, the important thing to answer your, your question more directly is that we uh, didn't want to make any hypothesis about how much we move other products. So we always um, take into account that we completely disturbed the situation and we want to have the whole information again. So in that sense, for now, it didn't make sense to say, OK, this one is more is better than the other one, or so on or so forth, because we just said we make one pick, and then we have to look again at the whole situation. But there are a lot of uh, clever ways to optimize and reduce the amount of processing needed and so. And for now, this hasn't been uh, tackled. OK, thank you. Welcome.
Thank you. Um, uh, my question is about uh, while um, the uh, packages are going on conveyor belt, uh, in your demonstration you stopped it and you take the frame, but generally the, uh, in industrial case it will be in a moment, then it will create lots of blurry, blurring effects. How will you solve this question or did you work on this part? Mm -hmm. Well, we did something a, a bit counter-intuitive uh, for vision, I mean computer vision application. We actually didn't look at lighting at all for now. So uh, this is the one aspect, and we know there, there are major improvements that can be made there. Uh, also, if you look here, you, you have a lot of reflections. Even in our template, we have reflection. This lowers the quality. Um, and the other aspect for your question is, um, right now, we are using a webcam. And this means we are uh, out of control of a lot of parameters because webcam behind the scene do many applications that uh, industrial cameras do not do. For example, you have heavy compression going on, uh, the stream, I mean, compression of the images and of the, the uh, stream, and you have less um, control over the exposure time and so on. So um, this is why we decided for now to stop the belt and reduce the, the blurriness. So, yeah, um, maybe we're a bit limited by using webcams here. If we go to a real industrial, um, how to say, using an industrial sensor will help us there. Better lighting and then um, more control over the exposition time and, and those kind of settings can help and then also get rid of the, the blurriness, uh, motion blur problems. Thank you. Um, with your vision system in the same area as the picking robot, does it really matter whether you pick the topmost? Uh, because you already assume that you disturb everything. Mm -hmm. So why not just do that? And why not just pick any package? Pick you mean? Yeah. Yes, but the the problem is um, so the 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 robot is using um, a vacuum. Uh, system like suction cups to, to grasp the products. The thing is, if you start, if I take the hypothesis that we do not care which one we pick, let's just pick a random one. So I'll say, uh, well, let's pick this one. Then you'd pick it in the center, center of gravity of the product, right? But then at the same time, you grasp this one and you don't know what's going to happen because maybe you cannot pick at all or maybe you pick both and then there are, then you place two products in the box when you think you're only placing one or during the movement they uh, get out of the, the head of the robot and then they fly, really fly through the machine and you don't know where they go to, so they can also disturb other sensors or so and more critical failures. So that's, that's why it's important to know which one is on top. We have some flexibility because maybe, well, okay, this one is overlapped, I mean, covered by that one, and maybe we can still perform a peak here. So there's also some flexibility or, or options that we are not making use of for now. But, yeah. Quite interesting. What if I would sacrifice the word deformable? Can you say anything on that? Because it's, it, this problem is, of course, this picking, uh, uh, bin picking is, is everywhere. Mm -hmm. I don't see really how much you use this, the fact that the, the objects are deformable. Mm -hmm. Well, deformable is more constrained on your product recognition because um, if you have a, a rigid surface, um, okay, basically if you have three points, you can already make an estimation about the orientation and yeah, so, but if it's a deformable, we had situations where on given overlaps, actually, the points are merged and we do not know if those are for So you're basically points. saying it's easier? With... If it's a rigid box... Yes, or, uh, it's much easier, yes. Okay, screw, a box full and, and, and with screws and it would be easy? Um, well, that. now you're taking into a, another parameter into account, which is transparency. And this is also why the scope of this project was focusing on printed bags, because we have visual texture, and also we are not disturbed by um, randomness inside the package. 
And this is a much more much bigger challenge if now we go to transparent bags because on the one hand they are transparent, so you try to see something invisible in a way. And I on the other hand you see what is inside the package and this disturbs also the the recognition operation. Okay. I thank think you. we should thank Vincent again. Thank you. We continue with Cyrano, Cyrano Vazur. Uh, Cyrano did his uh, project uh, in Belgium, in Leuven, uh, the company Flanders make. Uh, um, and he's one of the, the first MSD people to uh, present. You're the first MSD presenter in the whole history of uh, this program. Torsional vibration and backlash compensation using nonlinear feed forward control. Uh, and I also have some nice words for you from your colleagues. Cyrano is a genius at conceptual thinking. Meticulous in finding out what the customer needs instead of wants. Composed, pragmatic, very good at convincing people. Combination of an artistic spirit and a great engineering mind. A reliable and hard worker and he sacrifices himself for the team and replies to everything with a smile. He just proves it. Meticulous, caring, and responsible about his work. Good afternoon. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, guys, for uh, the nice words. Um, my name is Cyrano Fasseur, and today I will present the work I conducted uh, during the past year uh, in Belgium at Flanders Meek. Um, my title is Torsional Vibration and Backlash Compensation Using Nonlinear Feed Forward Control. Can imagine that not all of you uh, can get a picture with this title, but I'll try to make it clear. It, I think it will become clear. Um, the application is on a weaving machine. That's indicated in the subtitle. Model based control design for a high performance weaving machine. So, on the agenda for today is um, I'll uh, discuss an introduction where I uh, explain the basic principles of the weaving machine. I'll tell you what the problem is, how we try to solve it, what other problems pop up, and how we try to solve those. Then, the results, and finally, the conclusion. So, the weaving machine. The weaving machine is a machine that produces fabric from yarn. It does this in five sub-processes. I'm going to try to explain it through an animation. So, if we start with, uh, with the yarn on this side, um, and we end up with fabric, the sub-processes are the opening of the warp yarn, that's this uh, kind of Rectangle, rotated. Then the second process is a weft insertion process. Third one, beating up of this weft, and this is where the um, fabric is formed. The two parallel processes to this are um, let off of the uh, yarn and take up or roll up of the fabric. Flanders Make, the company where I worked, wants to improve this machine in three aspects, which are cost, effectiveness, and versatility. Cost is self-explanatory. Effectiveness means producing high-quality fabric as long as possible in the shortest amount of time. Versatility means being able to produce different types of fabric, so fabric for clothing, but also carpet, and different types of patterns on the carpet or fabric. Actually, we're going to try to achieve these key drivers by looking at or improving one of the subsystems of the, of the weaving machine. Actually, the shedding subsystem, the one that is responsible for shed opening, so this one. As you can see, it is a system with, with a motor which, dri which drives a camshaft mechanism through a rigid shaft. And this camshaft mechanism converts this rotation into 
oscillating motion, which is responsible for the shut opening. And uh, this project will involve improving this subsystem in order to in, uh, uh, achieve the improvement of the complete machine in terms of cost uh, and effectiveness. So let's look at this subsystem. In small, I represented it here. Actually, it's bigger, but it's a little bit uh, different representat representation. I explained how the mechanics work. And in addition to this, there's a control system because for shut opening, we required, for decent shut opening, we required spawn, constant speed of the, of the motor. So for achieving this constant speed, we use a control system, a typical feedback control system where we can basically measure the speed, compare it to what we want it to be, and if there's an error, we correct with it with a PID feedback controller. In addition to this, we use feed forward control, which is basically using accurate models of the plant and feeding the plant the exact input it needs to achieve the, to achieve the, referen the references. The problem with this system is that um, it's actually in the hardware. We have a motor with gearbox, and the gearbox has almost no play. And we have a rigid shaft. So the problem occurs when there exist small misalignments between the supports. What happens is that basically equipment breaks because of the rigidity of the shaft and the gear, gearbox. We, we cannot intercept for these alignment errors. So what Flanders make propose is by replacing this hardware with this tight hardware with relaxed mechanics. So basically going for a flexible shaft and a gearbox with some play. The advantages are we can intercept for alignment error, so stuff doesn't break. And in addition to that, a gearbox with play is cheaper. So also the cost uh, benefit. So this brings us uh, uh, the, the problem. This brings a new problem because we relax mechanics. What happens then is that the error, the tracking error increases. And then we need to solve, uh, we need to come up with another solution. And this way, we, we improve the control of the system. And in this project, I focused on feed forward control. Um, because we added complexity to the hardware, we add the same complexity in the feed forward models in the control system. This way, we can reduce the tracking error and um, yeah, improve performance. But we cannot recover performance completely because yeah, we, we took poorer uh, mechanics for performance. So there still remains a small amount of tracking error. And actually, because we improved the feed forward, possibly we're going to need more torque also to compensate for the undesired effects. This brings us to the main goal of this project, which is to illustrate a possible trade-off. On the one hand, we want low maintenance and low cost. And on the other hand, we want good performance expressed in tracking error and torque demand. So what do we pro propose? We say we start off with tight, tight mechanics, which is not good, which is bad for maintenance and cost. So we relax the mechanics by choosing a shaft with some flexibility or a reduced stiffness and a back, uh, uh, gearbox with some backlash. But then we see that the tracking error increases. So we improve control. And this is what you saw in my title, torsional fibrillation compensation and backlash compensation. So that's the part uh, I worked the most on. So that's the, this is the main goal, to, show, to illustrate this trade-off. How did we do that? Actually, we didn't do it on the weaving machine I showed you in, in the beginning. We implemented it on a small modular dive line. It's actually a test setup they have there. They want, just want to test it first in small and then later on implement it on the real machine. So basically, we want to build this on the small modular dive line. And the first thing I want to mention is that the camshaft mechanism in the uh, actual moving machine, it was difficult to build that in small on the drive line. We built something similar, which is a slider crank mechanism. We needed to do additional measurements because we added hardware. We needed to measure performance also at the load side, not only at the motor side. In addition, 
we measure the torque as a performance indicator. Um, so, as I mentioned, the part I worked mostly on was the feed forward part. And this is basically building good models. So if you have good models, you, you can give the motor the exact input it needs to achieve the performance you want. So, uh, yeah, we just de developed models, and then we compared the plant, which is the, the, the blue line, the plant, with our models. And yeah, after, sev after uh, several iterations, we could achieve decent uh, uh, match between model and and uh, plant. We did the same for the flexible shaft. We developed models and compared with um, the ac the actual plant. The backlash, however, we also developed models, simple models for the motor. But we, in addition to those models, we also developed a reference uh, adaption technique. So basically, we want the load to track a constant speed. But the backlash um, actually prevents it from, uh, or makes it more difficult to follow this uh, constant speed. So what we do is we adjust the motor reference on the moments we expect gap opening. So on the moments we expect this gap to open, which we do not want, we traverse the gap in the motor reference because we rotate, we, we, we control the, actually the motor position. So we use a correction profile to traverse the backlash gap. So yeah, this brings us to, the, those are the models I developed. And we, in the end, we designed the hardware. We designed the slider crank, which is there, the oscillating load. And um, yeah, we assembled it. You have the motor here, you have the backlash component, the flexible shaft. And I'll show you a measurement at a five hertz just to, to give you a feel of uh, what we do. So this is uh, rotating at constant speed, and we try to the 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 the, the sound shoe here, or actually we bump into an oscillating loop, but also the motor trying uh, correcting for the 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 the, the backlash gap. So let's look at the measurements. Um, as I say, we start off with tight mechanics. Then the performance is good, the, but we know that the tight mechanics will lead to damage of the components. But the performance is good. We see we have low torques. We will see that it's low in comparison with the next result. And we have low tracking error. When we relax the mechanics, so we go to uh, flexibility and backlash, we see that both the torque increase and the tracking error. So then comes the part where we improve control. Then we see that as we expected, we need more torque, but we can, signif we can reduce the, the, the tracking error. So this brings us to the conclusion. We said um, we want to illustrate a certain trade-off between, on the one hand, uh, low maintenance and low cost, and on the other hand, good performance in terms of tracking error and torque demand. And how did we want to do that? By relaxing mechanics, we know that the error would grow. It happens. But then improving control, the error reduced again, and um, we, we did need some more torque. But this trade-off illustrates, because with low maintenance and low cost, we know that we can improve the overall reefing machine in terms of cost and effectiveness. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, just a question here. Uh, how did you select the reference trajectory? The, ref the, the reference trajectory is a constant speed um, trajectory. So it's a ramp signal. Because we applied uh, position control, it's a ramp signal. And the reference trajectory is selected as a constant uh, speed signal because we want to synchronize all the subsystems. We looked at the... Uh, uh, the shedding subsystem, but in fact, we need, we need to make sure that we really track this constant speed because all the subsystems require that they follow their trajectories. So, because 
the weft insertion is dependent on when the shed is open. So that's the way uh, it's based on uh, synchronizing all the subsystems. Thanks, Rano. We continue with uh, Arash Ruby Zadeh on performance improvement and wafer separation machines. Arash worked at ASM Pacific Technology. What did I say about you? Hmm. Um, Arash, a true idea generator, a very creative guy and looks at things from different angles, very spontaneous, creative and ambitious. His curiosity and his drive to explore new things make him come up with unique ideas. Great implementation skills and out of the box thinking. Arash has two sides. One is a kid inside him that doesn't care about rules. He just wants to have fun. And the other side is a scientist in him that when he grips on an idea, he doesn't let go until he finds the end of it. I think that's quite correct. The floor is yours. Uh, hello everyone and uh, thank you for your kind words. I was working uh, on this project uh, in ASM uh, Pacific Technology uh, at uh, ALC or uh, ASM Laser Separation International uh, in last year. Uh, my supervisors in this project uh, were uh, Ralph Noyan, Ido Anike, and from TUE part, uh, Marcel Hertzges. Uh, the project was about uh, improvement of uh, uh, wafer uh, separation machines in the performance aspect. So to first uh, indicate what is this project about, uh, I shall uh, talk about the improvement in uh, electronics technology. So you remember there was a time that uh, radios uh, were that big and uh, we could actually, they were uh, sat on a uh, table or uh, desk to, actually, to use them. Then the next generation, with the advancement of uh, transistor technology, uh, we could have uh, smaller uh, radios. And now, actually, we have uh, these semiconductors in very small dimensions. Uh, seven by seven millimeters that uh, you can have uh, a radio uh, in your cell phone very easily. So we have this uh, with advancement in uh, integrated circuit technology. Uh, so in other words, an integrated system is the same radio circuit uh, made in a very small uh, surface called chip. Uh, so, how do we make actually these uh, integrated systems? Uh, this, uh, this goes with uh, first wafer formation, so making a plain wafer. And then we have uh, front-end uh, fabrication, so putting those uh, circuits on those wafers. That's what ASML does. And after that, uh, it's called back-end uh, fabrication. And uh, that's what uh, ASM does. One of the parts are, okay, after making those, uh, putting those circuits on those wafers, separating uh, all those uh, circuits, and uh, then putting wires on them, and then packing uh, those chips. I don't mean these uh, chips that uh, Vincent uh, mentioned before. I mean actually packing them uh, in <coughs> Uh, packages so that uh, we can use them on the circuits and the de defects wouldn't uh, harm them. Uh, so, uh, 
actually we uh, what what we are doing uh, what I was doing in LC and what LC ASM uh, does is in the wafer dicing uh, aspect in that area and so even so in that uh, also in that region uh, the accuracy and the uh, performance is also defines how 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 much uh, smaller we can go in the chip industry so there are several methods to actually dice uh, and uh, separate these uh, uh, chips uh, one simple method is uh, just using a saw a blade to cut them or using uh, lasers uh, to cut them and uh, ASM uh, technology uses laser to do that. Uh, so this is uh, how laser cuts through a wafer, and this is uh, a conceptual view of uh, the machine that they have. You know how the laser works. Yeah. So uh, uh, so there is a plane. The laser comes down, and there is a planar motor. Uh, down on the uh, under the wave under the laser and uh, the wafer actually is uh, placed on that and by moving that uh, uh, plate uh, the cutting process is done and uh, this is the machine uh, that uh, Alsi produces so as you can see this is the uh, slider that uh, on the white uh, placed the uh, wafer is placed and also uh, other the laser is at the top of it okay let me see oh, i found it and so i show you somehow a conceptual uh, view of uh, that laser dicing machine so the laser at the top uh, actually comes down and the wafer is placed there and with this movement we have uh, cuts uh, on the wafer and uh, these cuts uh, would also continue in the other direction, so then we have separated chips. Uh, ASM, as a producer of those uh, wafer dicing uh, machines, uh, have uh, some objectives uh, for uh, the machines it produces, also their customers like NXP, Toshiba, and uh, other uh, companies uh, have similar objectives. So the first thing that come, pops into mind is uh, higher accuracy. So uh, if we can cut those and dice with higher accuracy, uh, we always can go with, uh, uh, in lower dimensions. And then higher throughput, so you have a machine. Faster it can uh, cut the wafers, it's better. And lower cost and lower downtime. The downtime means that uh, all uh, industrial machines have some time that uh, they need for maintenance or uh, services. So if we can reduce this, uh, we would gain money. Uh, for higher accuracy, uh, what we mean is that uh, how straight actually we can cut those uh, wafers. And so uh, to actually work on that, I had to come up uh, Okay, what is the problem, or what are what are the sources of inaccuracy, and this is somehow a model of the system. So the uh, the wafer placed on the top of this gray area, and then uh, this green area is the stage, and uh, the laser. So actually, to explain how this problem comes up, uh, comes up, uh, I can. Uh, give you an example so imagine you are sitting in a car as we have all uh, we had these presentations about cars and imagine you want to uh, draw straight lines so when the machine vibrates actually you cannot make a quite a very uh, straight line and this is because we have uh, different uh, masses in the machine and we have uh, this kind of actuation that uh, makes those uh, uh, masses and springs uh, give this vibration to your body. And that's what's happening here. So we have this uh, stage, let's say it's here, and we want to make our straight lines here. And if these things actually, these masses also move, uh, we see that the straight line that we want to make 
uh, wouldn't be straight. And that's somehow what happens. So we would have uh, some vibrating uh, line that we are making. And if we look at uh, this in the frequency domain, we would see, yeah, uh, those are some frequencies that uh, uh, are peaking at some points. And actually, those depend on these uh, masses and springs that uh, are connecting to our main stage. So to actually reduce this effect, uh, I looked at a higher level to see what can I do to reduce this uh, effect. And in a, as a simple uh, control problem, we know that uh, we can reduce the error, the, as I call those, that straight line that we want to make, uh, with, different, uh, uh, with changing different aspects. So by changing the reference, so a simple way to not don't have any error is to just don't uh, give any input. So we would have zero input. Uh, it would be a bit stupid. But uh, also we can change uh, our plant. So maybe uh, we can improve the dampers here. So by having a better plant, we would uh, actually have a more stable uh, line changing the controller, what Cyrano did. Uh, so changing these two parts can uh, help us also to reduce the uh, error or changing the disturbances, uh, reducing the disturbances that come to the machine. But actually, um, after uh, analysis and seeing different possibilities, actually I went with the first one, uh, changing the reference. And uh, now I would explain uh, how I did. So we have our slider that uh, our wafer actually moves uh, with this kind of uh, uh, profile, movement profile. So we want to go from speed zero to some constant speed then that we can perform the cutting. So we have some acceleration. And before that, we have uh, some jerk. So before acceleration, the uh, derivative of acceleration is jerk, something like this. But if we actually look uh, in the frequency domain, we would see that the frequency uh, in frequency domain, that movement actually uh, has some zeros in some frequencies. And uh, those actually, those zeros are dependent on the, on A max divided by uh, Vmax and also Jmax divided by the jerk divided by acceleration. So we actually can change the placement of uh, those zeros. So where the frequent, uh, the, the reference is zero. So maybe we can find out, okay, what is the frequent, what, what is the frequency, what frequency actually this uh, mass gives, um, the actuation of this math, mass gives to this uh, M2 that we are one, we want to make our uh, straight line. And then we tune it somehow to put this zero at same frequency. So we would actually have no input at that frequency. And that, uh, that would be reducing so much our vibrations. And uh, that's what uh, I did. So making a, a module, designing a module to uh, give this input with tuned variables to this machine of trying to have lower uh, uh, control error. I designed a, a software uh, uh, design for that. And uh, so from our dicing recipe, uh, it gets the starting and end uh, uh, points and also the dicing speed. This dicing speed is actually constant. So depending on the laser power and uh, the process, this actually is defined by the user. And then with some other inputs with respect to the machine characteristics, uh, I would define those uh, parameters so I can actually change and tune those uh, frequencies. And uh, as I expected, uh, the results on the actual machine uh, resulted uh, quite a reduction in the uh, control error. So 
This is the control error uh, right now, and by the new design, it's reduced uh, to this amount. Sorry, I cannot, uh, these don't have any legends uh, because of the confidentiality. And uh, so what we see, we, we see around, depending on the use cases, we see around 20 to 40% improvement in performance. And uh, as a side effect, actually, uh, the design, because controls some other aspects of the machine, because controls the movement uh, of the slider, actually it reduces also the machine downtime. So, and something that we didn't uh, aim for, but as a uh, good uh, side effect, we have it. And uh, also in some use cases, actually it results increase in the throughput uh, of the machine. Uh, so this is what I have done, and uh, thank you for your attention. Questions? Thank you. Can you go back one slide? Yes. Uh, I, I'm wondering if I understand why is there a time shift in the, in the error? Actually, I did it uh, on purpose uh, to be able to uh, uh, compare those two. But uh, it depends. Actually, this is uh, also uh, depending on what you want uh, on the machine, but what uh, I have done here is intentionally, but at some points actually uh, it's, uh, it was difficult to match them completely. But uh, yeah, this is... Uh, so but this is not a sort of an artifact or an artificial Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, and, and if you go back one more slide, I was... Yeah. Here. Um, so if you have the the laser is in the uh, in the top layer. Yes. Right. This is coupled to the well in your colors to the green one. Yeah. Is it thinkable to have it decoupled, uh, completely decoupled? So there are actually. So you mean? Uh, so actually, I have uh, uh, proposed different solutions, and one of the solutions uh, that I proposed uh, was that complete new design and uh, because right now the force is applied on the green area so we have vibrations here and it uh, actually uh, and sensing is also done in the same dom same plane and uh, creates these vibrations uh, one would be actually we have the uh, not a force frame and a metro frame so uh, separate uh, the force from this plane. We have the sensor is the same plane and connected to this one, and uh, the force frame separated from that. And uh, around the problem was it couldn't be done during the uh, this project. So one of the aims of this project was to have uh, some implementation uh, during one year period. But uh, as a suggestion, and the design it was given uh, to the company, that it's valuable to. Okay. Yeah. More questions? Thank you very much. Uh, it seems to be a perfect solution. What do you think about the, the drawback of this approach that you use? What is the limitation? Yeah, the thing is, uh, first of all, it's like you have uh, more constraints on your movement. So uh, it's like you are limiting uh, your uh, maximum acceleration and maximum jerk. And the other thing is that, OK, uh, what problem we had because it limits the because at some point you have your motor your planar motor actually has a limited maximum acceleration or in other words limited force and uh, because you actually you want to put this frequency around uh, and those frequencies that we see here are actually low frequencies so this actually would reduce the jerk and 
In other words, it would reduce uh, the throughput. But uh, I actually came up with uh, a solution to increase and you make most use of this acceleration and increase it, uh, increase this acceleration so much that we wouldn't suffer from the uh, throughput. Okay. Thank you very much. Other questions? Okay, I think we should continue. Let's thank Hush. Tom, this is a project with Rijkswaterstaat uh, on maintenance and services in a DSM based product family platform for ship locks. Uh, totally different from what we've seen here before. And your colleagues say about you that you're highly intelligent analytical and resourceful, with great problem-solving skills. This is a guy who doesn't need pen and paper to solve problems. He has a structured and coherent mind, great combination of high-level thinking and technical skills. Quick learner with an excellent communication. Tall and talented. <laughs> Professional, pragmatic, and you can always count on Tom. The floor is yours. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Um, as Peter said, I performed my presentation at my project at Rijkswaterstaat on the subject of maintenance and services in a DSM-based product family platform for ship locks. I'll come to what that means later. Well, important to note is that uh, in the last project we saw that I uh, showed that our radios have been getting smaller. Well, over the centuries, actually, locks are getting bigger and bigger, and now we are building locks that are hundreds of meters uh, long. So it's a bit, of a, a bit of a difference. I'd like to start with explaining what a ship lock is, because uh, here in the Netherlands we have a lot of them, but not everybody is familiar with them. This is an example of a ship lock. Um, a ship lock's primary function is to facilitate uh, water level difference within or between bodies of water, for instance, in canals. Rijkswaterstaat is responsible for the national infrastructure in the Netherlands, which includes waterways. And here you see an example of a, of a lock. So what, uh, what you see is there is a chamber, because there are two sets of gates. One here is closed, and here over the ship there's a second set of gates that is now open. So closing both of these gates creates uh, a separated section of water. So you can use that, because in this case we have a ship wanting to pass from downstream, from upstream to downstream. So as the water in the chamber is the same level as upstream, we can just simply open the gates and the ship can enter the chamber. We can then close these gates and use drainage canals to let the water level, the water drain downstream so that the water equalizes between the chamber and the downstream area. And at that point we open the gates again and the ship can continue. In the same way, of course, you could do it in reverse. The ship could turn around, sail into the chamber, we, can, we drain it, we drain water from the upstream to the chamber, and the ship can continue. So this is kind of how it works. Well, what's the problem with ship locks? Uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, we have about 137 of them, and they are built with a lifetime of about 100 years, because as you can imagine, these are very expensive and very large projects. So that means that all the ship locks we built in the 1930s, the 1940s, and 1950s are now coming up for renovation, and that's a lot, that's about 52. So faced with this challenge, Rijkswaterstaat wants to re-evaluate re how they design locks and what kind of locks that they want to have. So they want to have a more homogeneous lock design because right now every lock is seen as a unique opportunity and a new design and we can think of all kinds of new tricks to put in locks, which means that we have 137 unique lock designs. And in maintenance, this is not helpful. Through modularization and standardization, we can come to uh, a lock design that has less variety and is thus easier to maintain, easier to build, and it's easier to gain knowledge of. So the idea is to create a family of locks, because if we just create one lock design and try to put it everywhere, we'll run into problems, because locks have different sizes. Sometimes a lock is near the sea and you have different requirements. So you cannot just use one. You still need to have this engineering to order character, but we want to have this family. So. 
two, the Rijkswater staat started with asking two questions. Which family, of, what's, which independent modules can we find in a lock? If we look at a lock design, which modules can we see within that design? Which modules are already there? Then if we do this for a lot of locks, which modules do we find back in most lock designs? Because that's your common core, and if you standardize those, you have the largest impact because you can replace them in almost every lock. So that looks a bit like this, this a framework like this. Say I have six components in my lock, A to F. Then in this platform, for each of those components, there's a number of standards. For instance, for component A, I have standard A1 and A2. Within that standard, I have standardized components. The blue box, I have components that can be standardized on most locks, but maybe in some cases not. The, yeah, the lesser blue box. And finally, there are components that you should make, design for, uh, anew for every new design. So how were these questions answered? Let me come back to the title, because my title says DSM-based. DSM stands for Dependency Structure Matrix, and Dependency Structure Matrix is a way of visualizing a system architecture. So here we have, uh, in this figure, which is a square matrix, you see on both sides, again, the same components, A to F. So say I have a system cons consisting of these six components, I want to know what the architecture looks like. In this matrix, I can document all the dependencies in the system. So in this case, A has a relationship with C because of this block. And I have the same one on the other side of the, of the diagonal because it's a symmetrical figure. So in this matrix, I have all the system dependencies and interactions in my system. But of course, this is not, yeah, that doesn't tell us anything. This, this is too much information for us, for us to understand. However, if we apply a clustering algorithm, so we look for groups and structure, you find the following diagram. So here we see two completely independent system modules, one of, mod of component A, C, and E, and one of component B and F. And we see that D has, a very, has an integrated function. It integrates the two modules together into one system. And D is referred to as the bus or hub. So you can imagine that with the DSM as a tool, uh, Rijkswaterstaat was able to find the system modules and uh, analyze the system architectures of locks. But what does such a DSM look like for a lock? Because of course a lock has more than six components. Well, it's a lot bigger. You see that we now have about 48 components on both axes, but the same structure still applies. So we have, again, a bus or hub, an integrating group of components here on this side. And what do you find in this kind of clusters? You often find uh, central control components uh, and power supplies that supply power to most of the components in the lock. Then we have, uh, then we can move on to the independent clusters. You have one cluster, which is more of the local control systems and the local power supplies. You have a cluster with the lock chamber itself, so the, basically the walls and the, the floor of the lock chamber. You have the outports, so the areas leading up immediately to the lock. You have the inner lock head and the outer lock head. By lock head we mean basically the combined system of the gates, the activators of the gates, the drainage systems that allow the water to pass through the doors, and the activators of those systems too. So, then we can move on to what actually I was trying to do. Um, Motorwaterwerk, the project that is responsible for Rijkswaterstaat for accomplishing this, has now come to the stage that they know which modules exist in locks and they know which modules they want to standardize. So the next question is, which working principle, which standard do you choose? And then the operational phase of your lock lifecycle becomes very important. Because if you look, um, if you want to compare different working principles, what's important? Um, maintenance costs, because 50% of, of the total cost of a lock over its lifetime come from maintenance. Reliability and availability. Reliability is a measure for how reliable your lock is, how often does it fail. Availability tells something about uh, what percentage of the time your lock is operational, what percentage of the time does it work. So in order to incorporate this, Rijkswaterstaat wants to incorporate these maintenance aspects into the lock family and to not create the same high level of variety that they also have in the lock designs, they want to have this also within the DSM-based representation. So, with this as a problem, I would like to define two concepts, lock maintenance and lock condition. So lock maintenance is the maintenance strategy that I am applying on my system to make sure that it remains operational. 
and the lock condition is the current state of the lock. And by that I mean, if you look at a certain component, it can be brand new or it can be very old and close to failure. Uh, ideally, of course, you would like the condition of your lock to be good. Lock maintenance and lock condition both exist at different levels. If I look at the highest level of the concept of a lock, then I have a certain high level strategy and my, st and my entire lock has a certain condition. But I can say the same at the lowest component level. Lock maintenance is what you can determine. Rijkswaterstaat can say, this is the kind of maintenance choices we make. And from that follows your condition. Because you use your lock in a certain way, you maintain it, and over time that leads to a certain state. And from, we can also link that back to those very important indicators, um, maintenance cost, reliability, and availability. Because the more intensive your maintenance, the better your lock condition, but also the more expensive your strategy is. And reliability and availability depend on your lock condition. If your con lock is in an excellent state, of course, it will be more reliable and you will have a higher availability. So we can kind of restructure these relationships and, and put them in a quadrant. So if I have maintenance at lock level and maintenance at component level, and I have condition at lock level and condition and com at component level, there are a number of relationships here. The first one is that my lock maintenance depends on the, comp the maintenance actions I perform at component level. Because com maintenance is always defined bottom up. So at a certain component, I perform a certain action, which, form which leads to yeah, eventually unlock level a certain strategy. The same happens at condition. I have uh, the conditions of all my components leading to the condition of the entire lock. And this is not simply the sum because some components are more important than others with respect to system functioning. And finally, there's a two relationship between lock maintenance and lock condition and component maintenance and component condition. <coughs> so with this as our playing field, we can really define uh, what we want to do and how we can incorporate maintenance aspects into this platform. Because this relationship is of course very interesting. It is very interesting to know exactly what maintenance you should do to find out what your component con and lock condition will be. Unfortunately, uh, as the state of the field is right now, we can only do this based on an enormous amount of data, so systems where you have thousands of versions out in the field, and then it's very generic solutions, a very uh, specific solutions, so not really generic. And with locks, you often have only one lock, so we don't really have the data to do that sort of analysis. However, if you look at what um, Rijkswaterstaat has been doing so far, so they have been looking at in a lock architecture, which dependencies do we have, which components influence which components? Actually, that also already answered this question. So the DSM, or the dependency structure matrix that we have, says something about this relationship, because it tells us if this component breaks, these components are connected to that, and they will also have trouble, and so on. What we don't have is anything about this <coughs> maintenance axis. So we would like to create something that, so, that also tells us what dependencies we have here and tells us more about this relationship. So to, to that end, we developed a new matrix which can be used in conjunction with the DSM. And we called it the resemblance matrix, because what it is, instead of an interaction being the dependency between two components, an interaction is, means that two components have similar maintenance needs. So say, to maintain a certain component, I need a, a crane a mechanical engineer, and I need to do it every three years. If I have another component which is exactly the same, but I need to do it every four years, it means that they have similar maintenance needs, and that is interesting to us. So what does this new matrix look like, this resemblance matrix? It looks as follows. So you see a very different clustering from the DSM. So again, we have on both axes, we have components, and it's a square matrix. And there is, uh, and there is an interaction between the lock chamber and the soil and the soil protection, so the um, the concrete layer protection protecting the ground from the power of the ship turbines. <coughs> this interaction means that they have similar maintenance needs, and this creates also a cluster in the lock chamber. These components have similar maintenance needs. You see the same between the actual lock heads, so the hinges where the gates are attached, civil mechanical components, so that means gates and leveling systems. We just see the same with activators and also the emergency power supply. And we see the same with sensors and communication systems. So these clusters come from two things. One of them is similar function, and the other one is similar subcomponents. Because 
Activators, of course, activator of the door of a gate and activator of the leveling system, these are very different skills because the leveling system is much smaller than the activator of the door, but they have a similar function and they share subcomponents. So though apparently they have similar maintenance needs. If you combine this resemblance matrix with the DSM, you have basically have the two views you want. Because in the DSM, I can look at, okay, which different components influence which different components. And in the resemblance matrix, I can see which components have similar maintenance needs and which components can I, should I maintain together or are very alike in the maintenance strategy. And interesting for instance, to see is, for instance, that uh, if we look if we look again at maintenance costs, unfortunately I cannot show you the numbers, but it's possible to project those kind of numbers on these matrices. You see that activators are a very expensive group to maintain. Also, civil mechanical components are a very expensive group to maintain. And you see that they have similar maintenance strategies. So the, these groups together form the, main, form the main maintenance cost. In the DSM, however, we see that the, acti the doors and the activators of the outer lock head are together and the doors and the activators of the inner lock head are together, which implies that if you want to standardize, it's best to start with these clusters, because apparently if you're looking at maintenance costs, they are very important. Um, in several case studies, we have proven that with these two concepts, we can find new opportunities for standardization, and that is also useful in the comparison of different working principles. Okay. This was my presentation. I hope it was clear. Thank you for it. Thank you for your attention. And are there any questions? <laughs> questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello. Good presentation. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, clustering. Yes. And uh, you show that in the l almost the last slide with your resemblance matrix. My question is, um, well, before the question, is good that you are making the segmentation of the locks based on the quality attributes of each component? Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, the question is, uh, which technique you use for clustering? Um, actually, the clustering algorithm we applied, um, I, the, the one I used, is, has been created by a PhD student uh, here working here also in the same subject. So I don't know all the details, uh, but I, I do know it's somehow flow-based. So they uh, basically try to find the optimum, uh, yeah, optimum configuration that lets uh, uh, an, an imaginary fluid flow through the matrix. I see. But again, I, I don't know the, the specific details. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, uh, just just to to make sure that I do not forget you. Uh, can you go back one slide or two slides? Um, uh, this one, no, this one. Okay. Yeah. Um, quite interesting. What surprises me a bit is. Um, I would view the sensors equally important as the actuators. They, uh, for systems functioning, yes, definitely. If you look at reliability and availability, yes. Um, from a maintenance cost perspective, it turns out that they are quite cheap. <laughs> but so it depends on what you. Uh, in the end, it's a tool, and it's up to the modeler to make the analysis. Uh, and I used here maintenance costs as a as a driver, but you could also look at reliability, reliability or availability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, that's exactly yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. 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 No more questions? In that case, let's thank Tom again. Okay. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. Hank will say a few words in a minute. I want to thank all uh, involved. And here you see the, the symbol of the Alumni Association. So all of you are now automatically part of the Alumni Association. And in about an hour or so, we'll be increasing from 36 to 50 alumni. Hank. Just to make sure.
Just to make sure um, that's within two hours uh, at the earliest that we have so many new alumni. Uh, we start at four o'clock at the ceremony, uh, just to make sure. At four o'clock, at 3.30 we start with tea and coffee. And at five o'clock, if everything works fine, you are all graduated. And Peter asked me to give a sort of final word here. Um, I, I try to, um, well, I, I, I used my opportunity here. I think I asked almost everyone at least a question. And I, sort of my question to you is, what, is, what was the, the common greatest divisor of all my questions? And I, I, probably some people know that, but for me, I find it very interesting to see how automotive system design as a, as a Pidenga education now embraces uh, um, and compasses or whatever word you want to use, also mechatronic system design. For me, it's almost at, at an equal level. I feel as happy with mechatronics as happy with automotive. And to me, um, and probably, is there anyone who wants to make a guess? What for me? There's one word I want sort of is leading in that. Is there anyone who makes it wants to make a guess what what that word is? Also, the very last speaker. Sorry. No, sensors. <laughs> Sensors. For me, the word is sensors. All what is happening here is about sensors. The new sensors, availability of new sensors the, that, that creates a lot of opportunities in automotive. If you think about your own project, even the mechatronics guys, they will all recognize it's about sensors. New sensors that we were not... When I was young, at your age, if I think about a camera, it, it's great, you made a picture one day, the day later uh, you had the film, you went to the shop, and, and a week later you had the, the, the pictures back. That's a pretty slow sample rate, I would uh, say. And what we see here, many of the automotive projects, but also the mechatronics projects, are about accuracy and, and, and how fast is it, the sample rate. And how good can we make the appropriate calculations based on that? And that is a sort of a common drive for all of you. And it's great. I mean, there is still a lot to, to, to be done, to go on for, for now. But also, I'm, I'm fully confident that also next year, next year, we will have projects as we have seen today. And this is probably something to think about. If there is any one of you who doesn't recognize himself, herself, in what I'm saying, there is still f one hour to go <laughs> to convince you, otherwise there will be a cl small problem with, it, with your diploma ceremony. Uh, I want to close, I want to close with one special thing. I, I want to thank one person uh, who played a tremendous role for all of you during the past two years, and that is uh, Peter Heuberg. Peter, thanks a lot. <laughs> And of course, with him, the Automotive Systems Design Secretariat and, and all people, I also should thank you as a team, but uh, I think we have time enough later with some drinks to celebrate this.